Hello and welcome to Censored. I'm Lloyd May Houston. And I'm Aoife Vertnach. And today we are beginning a, a sort of informal two-parter on politics. Oh, the hot potato. Um, Already um, with the potatoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jesus, yeah, I can't do that on an Irish podcast, can you? <laughs> I'm sorry for my hibernophobia listeners. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I you know, on the subject of stereotypes of Irishness or contentious issues within determining Irishness, our two episodes are going to be looking at both sides of the border or thinking about the, the ways in which the border informs the process of film censorship in the early 20th century. And so in this instance, I'm going to throw over to, to Aoife to introduce our southern episode <laughs> <laughs> of this dyad. Thank you. Right. Well, yes, we are talking about South of the Border from my side of the two-parter. Not that we're partitionist or anything. So I watched A Yank in the RAF from 1941. <laughs> and I'm going to go with The Yank in the RAF for this particular discussion because... It had a lot going on around it. And it's also my kind of war movie because it's a bit fluffy. I don't actually like the explosions and the guts war movies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's kind of why I chose it as well. But so you're, I actually, you're there for the movie, not the war. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If we want to problematize the genre, we'll get to that later. And I want to start with a quote from Sean Lamass, who's Taoiseach in 1959. He's just taken over from... De Valera, now the most hated man in Ireland, but once the most popular man in Ireland. And at a Fianna Fáil party conference, Sean Lamass said, we have here no political censorship and no censorship of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever lets you sleep at night, Sean. Yeah, I mean... It's a kind of clever sleight of hand that in a way up until recently was replicated in a lot of Irish political history writing where censorship gets to be put into like we have a problem with sex and so we can't talk about sex so we censor sex. But, you know, otherwise the democracy mm. is absolutely fine. We're, we're, we can talk about anything else. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. well, I mean, apart from the fact that bodies are politics, the other part of that is also not always true. <laughs> So, yes, I'm going to talk about the most political censorship in which Sean Mass was intimately involved, which is the Second World War. And of course, like censorship in wars, it's not unusual. It's not an Irish problem. Everybody does it. Propaganda and the fight against it and through it is part of censorship in all conflict. Um, but there is a really very famous quote, and I know you know it, Lloyd. Everybody who reads Irish history comes across this bloody quote about 15 times a day <laughs> it was as if an entire people had been condemned to live in plato's cave with their backs to the fire of life and deriving their only knowledge of what went on outside from the flickering shadows thrown on the wall before their eyes by the men and women who passed to and fro behind them uh, so <laughs> this is the description of the censorship in fsl alliance and it's it's really quite an evocative and clever one when you think about it. Absolutely. And also kind of weirdly fits particularly well with, you know, the, the cinema, right? His point is really about the simulacrum of knowledge. And I think when you think about censorship and the way that it plays into the way that we've talked in the Mae West episode where people knew she existed but didn't actually get to see her, I think is mm. something, you know, quite powerful there. But of course, you know, it's not weird to censor. But I think the Irish during the war were certainly for a nation that's technically not at war, um, <laughs> unusually severe. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to say it, it feels like the, the fact that we we're referring to it thus far as the war and not by the preferred euphemism of the Irish state is its own, you know, like the, if we're talking about simulacra of a kind of uncomfortable reality, I feel like the emergency... <laughs> as a label, is doing similar work. So yes, you're right. It is the emergency. And that's a state of government that arises from the political policy of neutrality. So neutrality sort of gives birth to the emergency because mm. part of the problem with the Irish version of neutrality is that it's a bit don't mention the war, literally and 
in every way. <laughs> Don't mention the war. It's a technically non-belligerency, sort of, which is mm. that you're not really fighting for everyone, anyone. And Frank Aiken, who's one of the powerful ministers involved in censorship in the war, sorry, the emergency, claims... You can mention <laughs> claims, the war. We, we, we can mention the war. <laughs> we can mention the war. So Aiken says that the neutrality, as he understands it, he says it is somewhere rather near a state of belligerency with both parties, which I'm just like, what? <laughs> We're fighting everyone. And those who criticise it at the time, including other politicians, particularly in the Shannon, there was a debate in January 1941, which is just after the Germans had accidentally bombed Dublin, by the way. So, you know, like, it is a war actually yeah. happening right there and then. <laughs> no one is really seriously critical of neutrality. It's more that they're critical of the ways that neutrality is being implemented but they do actually make quite strong arguments. They're pretty much like, you're both sides in this war. You know, <laughs> we're not allowed to say that one side might be better than the other. Like, we're not even allowed to say might. Not to mind, oh, currently the Germans are definitely the aggressors in this one. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and the censorship is used to enforce this in print and in film in all forms of media. Oh, and through the post as well, because letters are censored. But the emergency, actually, although it's kind of funny to think that they just decided to call a war an emergency, it comes from the Emergency Powers Act, which is basically how the country is run during the war. And nearly right. everything is run through it. It is total war in the way that it is for every other belligerent state, but no actual like participation in the combat by the state mm -hmm. so yeah the state is sort of on a war footing but not to go out there and fight the war but if the war comes to them i suppose mm -hmm. would be the best way of talking about it and as a result of the emergency powers act ireland gets another censor yay <laughs> <laughs> six was not enough <laughs> he censors the posts and telegraphs and so the telephones the telegrams the post but also is responsible for war censorship of newspapers. So he's a, a new guy and he has a deputy. So I suppose we're up to we're up to eight. Are we up to eight? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of censors at work at this point. <laughs> I just wonder if anyone said anything at all. <laughs> I, well, I kind of think they didn't. But <laughs> that's just my impression. But the film censor also gets new powers. Yes, but on to that later. First of all, we're going to talk about the film because it's, you know, much more interesting than bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's A Yank in the RAF. Have you ever seen it? I have not. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I must profess ignorance too. It stars Tyrone Power, Betty Grable and John Sutton. And like I said, my kind of movie, there's singing, there's dancing, there's a love triangle Beautiful. and there's... Pretty much the background is the war. <laughs> and of course, this is a 1941 film. So it's pre-Pearl Harbor. And it ah, is while America course. is itself technically neutral. So I, I was going to say, because in some ways I was like, well, why is a Yank in the RAF particularly <laughs> <laughs> noteworthy? <laughs> like, why, why is that you know, incongruous? This is an American production, extremely Hollywood. It actually opens with a bit of a sort of a mockery and a sort of a ha-ha moment about neutrality because the reason, the reason American pilots end up in the US is because to get around the laws about neutrality and not supplying people with arms, the Americans are bringing planes to the Canadian border in the film, towing it over the border and thereby... <laughs> donating it to Canada, who will then bring it to, bring it right. to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone thought the Irish were a bit funny about neutrality, <laughs> they were not alone. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how Tyrone Power, who's playing Tim, ends up in Britain, because he flew a plane all the way to Britain as part of the Americans supplying their allies, who they're not really allied to because they're technically neutral. Okay. But the film makes quite clear that, you know, 
this is fiction and we all know it's ha ha hilarious. But the reason he stays is because he sees some beautiful legs emerging from a car, basically. <laughs> and I'm not joking. It's <laughs> He turns around <laughs> and he goes, <gasps> shock. Because it's his ex-girlfriend and he recognises her by her legs. Because Betty Grable is actually incredibly famous for her legs. So it's a whole visual joke about her fame. Okay, right, right, right. So these these are trademark pins. (laughs) Yeah, I think they were insured, that sort of level of fame. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I know, I I just briefly thought the joke there was something along the lines of like, wait, British people can be sexy also? (laughs) God, no, no, actually, no. This film is very much about how not sexy British people are. (laughs) Sorry, England. (laughs) I mean, she is so famous for her legs, right? That in June 1943, Life magazine did a photo essay and they had 14 pictures. Only one showed her face. (laughs) And she has a lovely face, right? It's just... Yeah, I was going to say, that's... (laughs) Her legs... It's all about her legs. Damn. <laughs> yeah. She's the body. Like, I mean, okay, it wasn't just her legs, of course. This feels like was... proto sort of Tarantino. He, he, you know, he, he would localize it further down the leg. But, <laughs> um... <laughs> Good Lord, Hollywood. Yeah. So that is how we meet Betty Grable. But she does sing and dance as well. So, you know, she's okay. not just... She's not just, just not a just, pair of legs. Not just a pair of legs. And she is also in uniform because she's somehow got to England in a process that is left completely unexplored and is wearing a Wren's uniform. So she's now doing woman's war work. Janine Basinger actually argues that the way the film is structured around Betty Grable means it's not really a war movie because it's about her love life and her choices rather than about, you know, her involvement in the war. I, I would be intrigued to see what the what the, the Irish censor makes of that distinction or whether whether <laughs> it, <laughs> it holds water in, in their view. <laughs> yes, you're foreshadowing me there, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> well, so if we just talk very briefly about the plot, Tim, who's the Tyro who's played by Tyrone Power, he's a Jack the Lad scoundrel rake figure. And he's trying to pursue his ex girlfriend who, having been burned once before, is like, no, you know, we're over. I came here to get away from you, which seems a bit extreme because America's huge. <laughs> some so- some women will literally <laughs> cross continents and join the Reds to, <laughs> to avoid going to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he is cute, but he's not that cute. Like, anyway, So the other main character is Morley, who's a British officer in the RAF, who has a classic accent of the period, which means that At times you might be like, oh my God, he's grating so hard. Um, (laughs) He's posh. He has a mansion covered in ivy in Kent. You know, he's the perfect. So we're in full sort of received pronunciation territory. Yeah, full on. And then the other British officer is a guy called Pilkington, which is a classic aristocratic stupid name, I would argue. (laughs) And he's the stoogy dumb officer dude with a even plummier English accent, who's always angling for an introduction to Carol. So he's the comedy turn. So we have, you know, so we have a love triangle and a comedy (laughs) add-on. So Carol basically spends the film going, trying to work out which one of the two lads, Morley or Tim, would be a good bet. Does this come charged with a sort of, she is a symbolic avatar of an America determining where its loyalties lie (laughs) in this war? Or am I projecting too much kind of depth into this? I think you might be overdoing it just a tad (laughs) in this one. (laughs) Well, just on the... Sorry, I mean, I, I... This is a completely gratuitous anecdote, but I can't not bring it up. But, on you know, the, the whole sort of relationship between seduction and American neutrality is an interesting one in that one of the means by which the British uh, government sought to try and kind of put pressure on America to enter the war was to have, I, I may be fudging this, but the... Uh, 
the office for ungentlemanly conduct or something i think it was called <laughs> um, which comprised people like in fleming and roald dahl who were essentially dispatched to america in various you know kind of pseudo diplomatic um capacities to seek out the wives of isolationist political figures and seduce them so that they would nag their husbands into bringing in the america into the war and so there's a, there's correspondence from roald dahl to his kind of m figure where i can't remember the the kind of socialites in question but he's like this woman has ruined me she has she has fucked me from one end of the week to the other and i am spent and i cannot continue <laughs> And, um, it's, you know, his, his handler is like, no, you get back in there. <laughs> you... um, These voracious Americans, God. Yeah. But yeah, no, it was, So um... you're saying that they sent British dudes over as like Mataharis? Yeah, yeah. Charming, you know, sexy, blush, British... British wow. officer types to uh, My as, mind as is officially blown. <laughs> very penetrative cultural attaches. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. I mean, I wish there was that much going on in the film, but <laughs> I yeah, can't that's, that's the film that I now. want to see. <laughs> that's the film we all want to see. Who hasn't? Why hasn't it been made? It's it's certainly crying out to be. I mean, we get we get that many kind of you know Ian Fleming biopics. I feel like there's, you know, <laughs> Roald Dahl fucks for England. Is <laughs> fantastic, Mister Cox. <laughs> and all of this just proves that truth truly is stranger than fiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no one would have put this in a film in the nineteen oh. forties. So after she tells Tim, like, about the third or fourth time that, you know, we're done, we're through, and I'm over, I'm over you, he produces a ring, which he had bought for her, and a man handles her onto the couch and forces the ring onto her finger all the time while she's shrieking and kicking him and... Great. You know. Love it. No no notes. Yeah. The early 1940s. Just <laughs> Modeling wonderful consent. <laughs> Jesus. If you like it, put a ring on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> even if it doesn't like the Even ring. if it protests, just yeah, get that Jesus. ring off. <laughs> and then she can't get it off because it turns out it's the wrong size. So she's he buggers off on this, you know, great expedition in the RAF and she's left there going, oh, I can't even get the ring off. Oh my God. <laughs> but, you know, because when you look at the billing, even before you sat down, you knew she was going to choose Tim because she's Betty Grable. He's Tyrone Power. And who is this John Sutton dude anyway when he's at home? Like, he's just some English actor. Like, she's never going to choose him. But of course, why does she choose him? That is the question. And that's where the war comes into it. Because (laughs) it's because he takes his commitment to the RAF more seriously and like because plays a really active part as an RAF pilot whereas at the beginning he was very like this is just dumb this is boring yada yada and then he goes I know boring then he goes on a bombing raid (laughs) and gets shot down and they land in the Netherlands and it's all very dramatic (laughs) what (laughs) yeah Okay, it's okay. a conversion storyline, only you use the war instead of, like, God or religion or something. I... <laughs> <laughs> so he, he learns commitment through armed combat. Well, he becomes a serious person, as in there is a serious side to a man who is clearly, like, you know, just some mm. rascal. And he's also okay. working closely with Morley, even though they're rivals in love. They are not rivals in war, you uh, know? Okay. Now, all of this happens off camera. So I don't know how Carol knows that he's become a serious person, but she knows he's become a serious person in some way. I, maybe it's not important that she knows, but we know as an audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, um, she's just there trying to get that ring off. <laughs> 
Yes. Just, just if if she's not on screen, just assume she's sitting there with like lard, trying to kind of like work. It. <laughs> so of course she chooses the American hottie, right? And so at the very end, the last scene is Carol in the middle, walking linked arms with Morley on one side and Tim on the other. And Tim has just been caught in yet again trying to flirt outrageously with someone else because that's what he does for the whole film. <laughs> and and it's like, oh, great, Carol, great choice. Yeah, I yeah. mean, <laughs> yeah, lean into this one. And, and he just looks at her and he goes, I know, honey, I'm a worm. And they all laugh and go off into the sunset. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seems seems like a redeemed figure. Yeah. So I watched the full movie because that's the only one you can get now. But what came to Ireland was nothing like what I saw, actually. Okay. <laughs> Large chunks of what I saw didn't make it onto the Irish screens. <laughs> it arrived in Ireland in 1943, which is two years late. Hmm. So it is by now after Pearl Harbor. So the whole tenor of the world mm. has changed but anyway i suppose it doesn't matter if you know you're in neutral ireland anyway but this film was huge in america in 1941 it was like number two or three at the box office so you okay. know it's kind of a long delay for such a popular film possibly they thought it wouldn't be worth submitting because of the censorship uh, yeah. one of the things about the increasingly strict censorship is that you know, they're, they're just withholding a lot of film from going to Ireland at all because they don't want to pay just to be told, no, we're not going to give it a certification. And the longer your film, the more you pay. Mm. So it arrives to the film censor, Richard Hayes, and he demanded 29 cuts, right? <laughs> Twen- 29. Now you think, OK, maybe small little scenes here and there. Yeah, some of them are small scenes, but there's quite a lot of chunks that were cut. But just three of those, 29, were about sex. Betty Grable's legs were not that much of a problem (laughs) for once. (laughs) (laughs) If we were to do the do's and don'ts bingo, we would get like a very low score, basically. The 26 are under the film censor's new emergency powers criteria that he's supposed to use. He's asked to ban or cut if he thinks a film would be prejudicial to the maintenance of law and order, would be likely to lead to a breach of the peace, which is the same thing. So basically violence, right? Mm. It's going to incite violence in some way is the main consideration. The second consideration is the preservation of the state. So sedition or treason. And the third consideration is that a film might cause offence to the people of a friendly foreign nation. I don't know who's a friendly foreign nation because well, we're supposed I, to be I at war with to, everybody. Yeah, I was going to say that that's not self-evident anymore if we have this, yeah, sort of on everyone and no one's side yeah. kind of attitude. So as a result of these criteria, they sat down and came up with, well, what are the things that might be covered by these broad principles? And anything to do with, Parades, military movements, I mean, shelters, sandbags, basically. <laughs> right? I know. How do you have a war movie without any stuff to do with war? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's mind boggling. Any references that would be for or against belligerence? So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anything? Really? So that's propaganda, you see. Mm. Anything that tends to glorify the empire or British rule, that's not a surprising one in the context of Ireland. (laughs) No, fair. (laughs) You know. (laughs) It seems funny to have it just for this period when you could argue that a lot of people found that offensive before 1939 and after 1945. But, okay, fair (laughs) enough. The news films, you know, the newsreels that are shown before the, the main features... They're supposed to be free of war news. I don't know how you'd have any news left. Yeah. (laughs) It's a world war, lads. Like, really big. Like, uh, is it just going to be silly season for, like, (laughs) six years? (laughs) There there were complaints that the newsreels were 
dog shows, football matches. <laughs> Didn't seem wow. to be much news, you know? Yeah. Um, and then in another classic Irish one, any references to our king, we, in a way that would mean the British, and <laughs> our troops. I, but surely... <laughs> Your face like, is so funny. An Irish audience could be trusted to, like, absent themselves from those pronouns. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I think that they are familiar with the concept of Britain as another country. Yeah, like things can be from elsewhere and be <laughs> intended for that audience, and then you see them. <laughs> Apparently not. Cause wow. your little brains to melt. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. And of course, you know, if we want to talk about the border, on the other side of the border, it's our troops. It's our yeah. king. Like, this isn't just vague preservation of the state. This is... It's undermining our whole effort, whatever the emergency is, to say that Britain has an empire, to say that Britain has a king, to say that it has <laughs> troops, to acknowledge the war is happening... To say that either side might be good, and also to say that people have bomb shelters. Yeah, that that's where it really begins to kind of break down for me. I could understand a push toward mandating a certain degree of, you know, quote-unquote objectivity. But to kind of be like, we can't depict anything that indicates that there is a war. <laughs> is is a whole other sort of conceptual level. It's mad because the newspapers, although they're heavily censored, do actually talk about that there's a war going on. I mean, maybe not in as much detail as belligerent countries, but it, it's there. It's not like nobody knows that the war exists. Well, it, I mean, you know, it's it's worth knowing who currently runs Poland or... You know, like. <laughs> it's news it's just yeah. normal news isn't it it's like what government is in power right now yeah. <laughs> are we That's... about to have new neighbors <laughs> so to speak yeah. do we need to consider having a different diplomatic relationship with next door <laughs> yeah how much german uh... should i be learning <laughs> <laughs> none because we're too busy learning irish lloyd seriously <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so this incredibly thorough list is what leads to the 29 cuts, right? So I was going to say, is this just like a film in which like people (laughs) just kind of teleport from place to place and there are no exterior shots? And like, how do you depict an airbase under these? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think they were fortunate that the airbase didn't have too many flags hanging around it. So they do show the airbase, but they do cut a piece in which Tim is being instructed on how to shoot down a German fighter plane. Because, you know, it shows the plane and it has insignia and it's also an instruction on how to, you know, one side might kill the other side. So that's kind of like taking sides, I think. It's it's emulatable. (laughs) <laughs> the, totally, the youth yeah. of Ireland might take to the skies and I mean, shoot if down I was a BF-109. In, <laughs> if I was living in Mitchellstown, I would 100% try and go and shoot a German plane down, having watched yeah. that film. They also cut the kind of plane porn elements of the film. <laughs> so, because it's a film about planes, hmm. you know, there's a lot of planes flying around and being lovingly shot from as many angles as possible think top gun only black and white and you know not a shiny obviously less uh, volleyball <laughs> no there's no volleyball very sad <laughs> there's also no men in towels it's distressing so yeah they cut the sections of the plane porn because they're on their way to bomb germany so you have to cut that they probably also mutilated part of what made the film nearly earn an oscar it was nominated for best special effects Okay. And actually, it's quite good. It has these scenes with the searchlights coming up. So the black screen and then the white beams. And it's actually mm, beautifully okay. done, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really graphically beautiful. And I can imagine that that must have suffered quite a bit. So I can only imagine how ramshackle the film was by the end of it. There's really only Betty Grable left 
yeah. dancing and, you know, talking Madness. to Tim <laughs> in her flat. But even though it must have been a bit of a state by the time it went through the 29 cuts, between the 10th of September and the 24th of September 1943, in Dublin Savoy Cinema, they sold 40,000 tickets to see it. Good Lord. Yeah. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. There's electricity shortages, which is limiting the amount of time the cinemas are open. The buses and the trams and the trains are all stopping very early, so you can't get to see the late night shows, so they don't exist anymore. And also because the censorship has become so severe, only about 250 films a year are being submitted to the Irish censor. Wow, That's okay. half of what is being submitted to the British censor. So... Right. Like there's a real dearth of new material. <laughs> and also the old films that had been certified before in 1939, before the emergency powers, they get pulled, a lot of them, because they are now no longer acceptable under these new terms and they have to be right. recertified. And of Jesus. course, the distributors don't always want to re recertify yeah. everything because we already paid once. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's a whole... There's so many reasons why there's so little to watch and why you would definitely go watch something no matter what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then there's a twist in the tale, right? Oh, yeah? From, from the 24th of September, 1943, it was pulled. <laughs> the, certif the certification was revoked. Okay. So he, he, even whatever this fever dream of people inexplicably show you know kind of showing up in different locations disappearing from the film for a while while they're shot down in a country you don't get to see even that's too much yeah yeah it gets pulled and it gets pulled because in addition to all the other censors from july 1942 the emergency powers are amended and any minister can intervene to revoke certification <laughs> Great. <laughs> we didn't have enough censors. <laughs> no, no. So it's it's basically open season. Anyone can just be like, here, don't like it. Yeah. So the minister in question is Frank Aiken, and he is the minister for coordination of supplies. And he pulls it himself directly. And when he's challenged on this, the exhibitors go to meet him after this, mm. after they've, the yank has been pulled. And they're like, look, After you the know, yank has been yanked. <laughs> <laughs> Should we use that for the title? That's quite good. I I well, wouldn't object. <laughs> no, yeah, but it might get <clears throat> censored because people would think it's rude. <laughs> yes, no, no, no yanks being no yanked yanks or being yanking yanked. in this. <laughs> no, no. So yes, so the film distributors or no, the the cinema owners go mm. to meet Frank Aiken. And they want to have a meeting about the supply of film, logistics, and the fact that we just don't know what we're going to be able to show from week to week. If you're going to pull films like this, yeah. how are we going to run our businesses? And they said, we heard that a party called Altira Nahashheirige caused it to be pulled. Now, you might not have heard of this particular splinter group, have you? No. <laughs> no, neither had I. Thank God, because, whoa, they are... They are grim. <laughs> it was also, this betrays both my middling German and complete dearth of Irish. I was I also initially wasn't sure whether that was an Irish or German language organization. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it is. It is Irish. Yes. You can see where I'm coming from. It's like the old what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nothing old. Altira <laughs> is architects, apparently. And Ash Eirige is resurrection or resurgence. Ooh, architect. Yeah, that's that's giving me real... Real like, fascist vibes. Yeah, those people have skulls on their uniforms. <laughs> like, that's... <laughs> They're a considerably less famous Irish fascist party than the Blue Shirts. I've okay. never heard of them before. Yeah, I was going to um, say, I... yeah. What I find interesting about their name, I mean, first of all, resurrection, bleh, like christian weirdness yeah. um but also irie amach nakoska which is the easter rising irie is rising so yeah, they're also yeah, 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 yeah. 
when you look at mm. it visually, you go, oh, okay, 1916. So it does two things at once, Yeah, uh, which I'm sure they're very conscious of. They're run by a combination, a very small combination of Irish language zealots of the worst kind, like <laughs> absolutely the worst of the worst, drunkards and pedophiles. So. Oh, great. <laughs> Glad they find each other. So that's who the film distributors blame for this problem. Aiken says, oh, absolutely not, because he couldn't agree that he had ever listened to anyone as crackers as that in the yeah. first place. Because they want to overthrow the state. Like, you know, they're a fascist party, so yeah. you couldn't possibly agree to that. But and so were another... they objecting because they, they viewed it to be... Are they doing this out of sympathy with, with Germany? Yeah, I would think so. Yes. Right. Yeah. They are definitely pro-Axis rather than (laughs) pro-Ally. Now, whether they did write to anyone is another question. This could be the Dublin rumour mill. Like I say, Aiken denies it. But when he meets with trade unionists about the same subject a week later, he says, no, no, I just I got a letter from old IRA men who objected to the content of the film. Right. (laughs) Now, the old IRA man could well indeed be involved. I, I was going to say, that really doesn't rule out the... No. Um. <laughs> There's a bit of an overlap, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... So, it, it is pulled Good because Lord. Frank Aiken gets a complaint from Republicans of fash. Sunstripe. <laughs> who may be the fash. We... Jesus. Anyway, Frank Aiken gets a complaint from someone unknown decides that they're right and then pulls pulls the film it doesn't appear on the screens again till after the emergency powers have lapsed i i advise people to watch it because it's just it's quite relaxing as a war movie goes (laughs) it's very low stakes it is not genocide Mm. horror this is oh Let's have a little dance and decide which man looks nicest in uniform. Well, I'm, I'm increasingly realizing that, like, in some ways, this does bear similarities to Top Gun, particularly Top Gun Maverick, right? The kind of, yeah, the you know, we need to, we need to go take out this installation, which is in a country we will not specify. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Afghan, Iraq, Iran, <laughs> Russia, Stan. Yes, I do yeah. think these these forties movies with the RAF. We should definitely look at them and then go and look at Top Gun and be like, how how do we get from there to there? But well, you know, but plane go whoosh, Eva. <laughs> big big plane go whoosh. <laughs> yeah, and they're sexy, it. and the men have nice uniforms. What yeah. more do you need? <laughs> Jennifer Connelly's there and you can't use a phone in her bar. It's, it's better. It's better life. <laughs> so yeah, after 1945, it's resubmitted for certification because emergency powers are gone and it just gets four cuts. Okay. What what are the, is, the lingering? One of them is one of carol's dances presumably the particular shorts were too short so the legs are finally cut (laughs) the the legs are a problem at some point i oh yes the tussle on the couch where he shoves the ring on her finger and stuff that wasn't allowed through i mean rare to be like i'm with you irish censor but i in this instance i am so they after 1945 you're allowed to once again show films in which The British are a sympathetic protagonist in the midst of the war, even though literally like... With the benefit of hindsight, we've recognised that perhaps the authoritarian genocidal regime was worth opposing. And I'll just, to finish up, tell you how many films were banned and cut in the whole emergency powers era. So from the beginning of the war to the end of the war, or the emergency, 265 films were completely banned. I'm sure that it got harder to pass films after Pearl Harbor because they became so much more about Americans in combat. So Hollywood is producing material where the main actors are in uniform all the time and they're actually killing Germans. Tyrone Power is in one called Crash Dive, which is another feckin' love triangle thing it's it's submarine porn this time 
And like you couldn't keep any of it because there's flags in nearly every scene and you're blowing up Germans. So there's no way you can pretend this is a neutral film. Yeah. <laughs> so they banned 265 films and they cut uh, 1,171. Jesus. That's a lot, right? And as you say, on top of that, you have basically a halving of the rate of submission. Yes. So that's only 50% of yeah. what other countries are getting, which means like, so if there's 250, say, submitted every year, that means of all that were submitted over the six years, like 78% of them were cut. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say cut quite significantly as well, not just little little trims, yeah. but if this is anything to go by, you have to cut swathes of the film in which they talk about the war. <laughs> It's just mad. Yeah, it's sort of un- unintentional Irish surrealism. <laughs> just all of these <laughs> bizarre kind of collage pieces of <laughs> disconnected scenes. I think I think film goers must have had this amazing capacity for filling in blanks or <laughs> like spinning sections of the film into sense because yeah. it must have been quite jerky at times. <laughs> <laughs> And one of the complaints, actually, when you say surrealism, one of the complaints from politicians in that January 1941 debate is that Sean Lamas, Taoiseach, in 1959, but the guy who really runs the economy during the war, mm. his, gov- his government department is responsible for controlling all of the economic activity. So he's like hugely powerful in a functional way. And he complains that people speak and act as if the war were being fought on another planet instead of in the immediate vicinity of our shores. And everyone's like, well, <laughs> you can't... that could be because we don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you can't depict sandbags. So, yeah. Yeah. So wow. he thinks there's a lack of urgency, you know, because he's running mm. the emergency economy. And clearly, sections of the population who aren't that bothered are like, what's the big deal? Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. Turns out there's a war on. <laughs> <laughs> Belfast's on fire. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, it's so bad that when the Germans do bomb Dublin, the newsreels in the cinema cannot mention that it was Germany who did it. Jesus. That's, yeah, that, that's a problem on quite a few levels. It's like, okay, so things are just blowing up and we're not going to say <laughs> who blew them up. Yeah, so that's that's my crazy story about a yank in the RAF. Do watch it. I think you'll enjoy it. It's very silly. Well, I will check it out. And I can't wait to hear how this emergency madness is going to feed into... D- yeah, I mean, it's not... Not uniformly in the ways you'd think, to be honest. I mean, once again, if you want to if you want to watch a cohort of people getting very worked up about a very incoherent set of things, um, just just you wait. Well, I can't wait. 